There is always something very fascinating with being able to predict the future. With being able to understand the desire of other people as well as yours. In a prophetic dream, someone can see the future. You can look to dreams to be provided with some certainty or reassure that you are where you should be. To conjure future visions in your dreams, you will need a black pen and a piece of paper, a glass of moon water, a pinch of ground cinnamon, some rose oil, a bowl for blending, a glass, a red and blue candle, and finally, a glass of moon water. Light up the two candles and place them on your bedside table. Blend the ground cinnamon, the rose oil and the moon water in a bowl and then transfer the portion in a glass. Write down your intentions and what would you like to know, then fold the paper three times towards you and add it to the glass. Pass the glass through the candle smoke seven times. As you do this, visualize your ideal future, what the ideal outcome of the spell would be for you. Leave the glass of water together with the paper beneath your bed for seven nights. That's what we were speaking about yesterday. Yeah. Um, You've got some books with us today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That'd be nice. I'd like a little reading. Five minute reading. Okay. It's a coffee. So any bit about like walking. Roads accompany us for so much of our lives. How much time do any of us spend more than a hundred meters from a road, or out of earshot of their whispering voices? And yet we have somehow trained ourselves to not really notice them at all. We are absorbed by infrastructure, numbed by vibration. As we observe the world through the cinema screen of the windscreen, our minds travel elsewhere while our bodies journey to their destination. Things are moving fast yet slow. Time and the truth feel distinctly elastic. Who knows where it will be by the time you're reading this? Rebecca Solnit tells us that the first lesson a disaster teaches is that everything is connected and that it also shows us, if we're paying attention, what's strong, what's weak, what's corrupt, what matters and what doesn't. The plant reminded me that if we harvest with respect, the plants will help us. The guidelines for the honourable harvest are not written down or even consistently spoken of as a whole. They are reinforced in the small acts of daily life. But if you were to list them, they might look something like this. Know the ways of one who take care of you so that you may take care of them. Introduce yourself. Be accountable as the one who comes asking for life. Ask permission before taking. Abide by the answer. Never take the first, never take the last. Take only what you need. Take only that which is given. Never take more than half. Leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully. Never waste what you have taken. Share. Give thanks for what you have given. Give a gift in, reciproc in reciprocity of what you have taken. Sustain the one who sustains you and the earth will last forever. I just really want to own here. Yeah. Long ago pain, as if for the first time. Though it can feel apocalyptic, this pain or fear of pain is not the end of the world, because there has never been a world. The image of a coherent world, a supplement to the ideology of whiteness, is upheld in the violence of the border, the nation, even the law. Let it go. 
In place of a world, there is the disorganized and proximate texture of the everyday. There are close friends and closer enemies. There is a particular body. There is this room. It's one of the first and biggest public rewilding projects in Britain. What you could potentially see here is a mosaic of habitats where we potentially have new planted woodland, which is native, coming into this regenerated woodland and then carrying on right up onto some more open moorland on the top. The, the possibilities are endless for what we could do here. It's like the beginning of freedom of movement and the infrastructure to create national parks and make them public spaces. Um, and so there was a, a gathering of people, I think 500 or 600 people, which we'll have to double check that, at the car park that we were going to go to. And that's when they set off and walked up here. It was publicly advertised. So if the police showed up, they showed up. It wasn't like a secret thing. And it was a, a big protest of just walking. I think it was a six or seven mile walk over these lands. The um, owners of the land, some of the owners of the lands were there, some police were there, but there were they were hugely outnumbered by civilians from the kind of northern powerhouses of um, Manchester and Sheffield, who really needed that escape from the cities. And rambling was was the way that they got that. Reappropriating like space, whether it's like in cities, you, t you obstruct traffic. And then if it's in a space like this, you literally just like open a gate that might not necessarily be for yours to open and walk into another yeah. part of like green. It's just, it's a construct of like who owns what and private space and public space. But actually like the freedom to walk through it being a form of protest kind of like shows us the society that we're in where it's actually something as peaceful as walking space can cause some form of havoc when really it's just walking in a space just with other people engaged in a socially towards an idea of something which is usually a form of like equality or freedom. Steel for structures, steel for bridges, for rails, for machines. Everywhere it is steel, steel, and more steel. You have invited us, set the space frame, given us a voice which can also be taken. Here we are within this frame. We accept the invitation. Thank you. Our action is validated by the Bauhaus Archive a hundred years. The topic is set. But we ask, whose legacy is it? We disavow to follow seemingly inherent ways of functioning. This legacy is not ours. So why should we carry it? The aspirations stemming from this legacy have been damaging. We see its consequences unfold every day. The norm always pretends to be the beginning. We seem to follow what we are forced to be used to, the status quo. A few sit in the front, the most sit at the back. The shaping of knowledge is an act of power, stolen from and imposed upon. Our emotions and feelings cannot be typed, classified, because they live beyond your understanding. The quest for empiricism has brought pain and suffering. This is not our knowledge, for its foundations were laid upon the indignation of many. Who decides yellow is for triangle, blue for circle, red for square? Must there be a front and a back, a top and a bottom? Must the triangle always be a pyramid? Freedom of choice is something that is largely denied to many along multiple lines of discrimination. Throughout time, we have been divided. Our bodies know 
that this is always racist. Let's make it clear. Diversity is not a challenge. Wait. Listen. A universal utopic future cannot be. We must listen to the silence. Listen to the silenced, the unknown, the unnamed, and the buried. We refuse to take freedom. Because it is not yours to sell. And now, how do we come together outside of the imposed unjust boundaries? Perhaps it is not new. It was already there, already active. We will not forget or forgive. We will neither revise or revive. We realize and accept this chaos, loss, as our own. Steel, the metal of metal. Steel for structures. Steel for bridges, for rails, for machines. Everywhere it is steel, steel and more steel. If the community becomes wealthier, rents go up. To escape this, renters will borrow as much as they can to buy their freedom from it, through a mortgage for a freehold. If housing prices were based on money people actually have or earn, bidding could only go so high. But because it's based on mortgage credit, the limit is the amount of debt that banks are selling. When mortgage lenders were deregulated, it allowed them to sell mortgage debt to anyone without checking they could afford it. So more people could borrow more and house prices go up and up, a bubble waiting to burst. House value is land value, and land value is location value. It's access to infrastructure, jobs, schools, trains, culture, green space. By 2016, land accounted for 70% of the price of a home. And because the land system favours the privileged, it actively upholds race and class inequality, from the homes available to the quality of schools and community infrastructure in proximity to them. Being near an Ofsted excellent school adds between 40 and 100k to a property, while state schools aren't free. The UK's land system is designed to store and pass down wealth, pretty much tax-free in land. Property developers create wealth by buying cheap land and waiting for planning permission, increasing its value tenfold. If you have or come into money, you'll store it in land. If you're not a property developer, you might end up with an empty home. One in ten people in the UK own a second home. Quite a lot of people own more than one. If you're trying to buy your first home, you're probably bidding against them and buy to let landlords and offshore businesses. The land is horribly allocated. We have plenty of space, we've just sold it all to the same people. 1% of the people own half the land in England, people like the Queen and Hoover man James Dyson. Around 15% of the land in England and Wales is unregistered, so no one really knows who owns it. That's because it's never been sold, often since the Norman Conquest, which was in 1066. A lot of this land is protected by trespassing law. You can't even walk on it. Only 10% of English land has right to roam. If it's not clear who owns the land, it's very hard to hold the owners accountable for it and buy it back. Last year in the UK, we spent 71 billion on rent, 67 billion on mortgage payments, and 23 billion on housing benefit. That's money paid for access to a home, often to wealthy individuals or banks. Rent is a tax paid to the wealthy. That's left over from the feudal system. If that tax was reduced, stabilized, and paid into a pot that provided for the common people, we might have something that looked like a land commons. The land belongs to the people, and they all pay into the pot to maintain it and reinvest into community services and infrastructure. Last year we paid enough to run a whole second NHS. You could still own a home. A land commons would only own the land beneath it. By paying into the pot for your bit of land, you hold the right to inhabit and build on it, and own what you build. 
the land value be recaptured by the community who created the value in the first place. A landowner shouldn't be a lord, they should be a steward. You rent a piece of land from everyone for as long as you want it. You become a steward of the land, an owner of a home, and part of a mutually beneficial system. Revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. It is a noticing resistance to oppressions in their complex interconnections, including their interlocking to fragment people categorially, that we can sense each other as possible companions in resistance, where company goes against the grain of sameness as it goes against the grain of power. Noticing the tensions from within a logic of resistance enables one to acquire a multiple sensing, a multiple perceiving, a multiple sociality. As one understands the limits, erasures, violations and reductions of oppressions, one also begins to understand them as they are resisted. Trespassing against the spatiality of oppressions is also a redrawing of the map, of the relationality of space. Trespassing is very difficult to achieve, since there are a great many ways to entice one back to the road of collusion with power. The logic of as if presupposes a distinction between actual and possible worlds. When I speak of different worlds, I do not have the logic of as if, nor the implied distinction between possible and actual worlds in mind. Rather, I focus tenaciously on actual worlds. These worlds are all lived, and they organize the social as heterogeneous, multiple. I think of the social as inter intersubjectively constructed, in a variety of tense ways, forces at odds, impinging differently in the construction of any world. Any world is tense, not just intense inner turmoil, but also intense acknowledged or unacknowledged contestation with other worlds. I think that there are many worlds, not autonomous, but intertwined semantically and materially, with a logic that is sufficiently self-coherent and sufficiently in contradiction with others to constitute an alternative construction of the social. Whether or not a particular world ceases to be is a matter of political constatation. No world is either atomic or autonomous. Many worlds stand in relations of power to other worlds, which include a second order of meaning. This is written from a dark place, a place where I see white, unclear woman as on the other side, on the light side. It is written from a dark place where I see myself dark but do not focus on or dwell inside the darkness, but rather focus on the other side. To me, it makes a deep difference where I'm writing from. It makes a profound difference whether I'm writing from the place of our possibilities as companions in play, or from the place in between, the place of pilgrimage of liminality, from the place of resistance, the place within, or from across the other side, where light and dark are highlighted. I inhabit a place from across the other side with anger, pain, urgency, a sense of being trapped, pounding the walls with a speech that hurts my own ears. It is from across the other side that I want to explore the logic of pluralist feminism. I am reading Lorraine Bethel's What You Mean, We, White Girl, and June Jordan's Where Is The Love, 
10 years after the publication. A layering of voices of women of color comes to my mind, crowding my thinking space. Voices that I have heard nearly attended to with gladness that fills one when one learns really good news. Voices that have accompanied me sweetly. The voices of all speak this knowledge to me. One just does not go around alone, lonely maybe, but not individual style alone, making or remaking anything, ignoring the relations one has, the ones one does not have, the good about the good ones, the bad about the bad ones, and the good ones. To know oneself and one situation is to know one's company or lack thereof, is to know oneself with or against others. I just spoke with my mum on the phone and she was really upset because um, on practical terms because my brother's moving out and obviously she wants him to do what he wants and to you know be an adult and be free but he pays towards her rent and um, it means that she it's not going to really be able to afford um, the rent for where she lives, which I should add is also in social housing, and she can't apply for housing allowance because of the bedroom tax, and um, she said something to me that I thought was really sad, she just said that... um, she, because I said, well, maybe you could get a lodger, she said yeah this is true but I'm 64 I I should you know be able to live by my means and just enjoy a place of my own and it's wild that that is just a piece of utopia um yeah (laughs) I don't really know what else to say.
If only she was a little bigger, Grandmother thought. Preferably a good deal bigger, so I could tell her that I understand how awful it is. Here you come, headlong into a tight little group of people who have always lived together, who have the habit of moving around each other on land they know and own and understand, and every threat to what they're used to only makes them still more compact and self-assured. An island can be dreadful for someone from outside. Everything is complete, and everyone has his obstinate, sure and self-sufficient place. Within their shores, everything functions according to rituals that are as hard as rock from repetition, and at the same time they amble through their days as whimsically and casually as if the world ended at the horizon. Grandmother thought about all these things so intensely that she forgot about the potatoes and beneath. She gazed out over the lee shore to the waves that swept around the island on both sides and then rejoined and moved on towards the mainland, a long blue landscape of vanishing waves that left only a small wedge of quiet water behind them. A fishing boat with a big white moustache was sailing across the bay. This is a story about the end of civilization, Earth, life, and when we really get down to it, me. Although heroism is one of my least favourite ideologies, we don't need a hero. We need justice, we need words, we need action, and we need actionable words. It's as if we're living through the end of our times. To combat this despair, we need to reclaim utopia. The utopian approach allows us to not only imagine what an alternative society could look like, but enables us to imagine what it might feel like too. What would living in the good future feel like? How would we live? How would we love? Thinking about these questions is hard because it requires us to think of a qualitatively different world. Dystopia is the easy way out. It's lazy. Instead, we should let our daydreams of utopia grow fuller. Let them, as Ernest Bloch says, enrich themselves and become clear. The children work side by side with artists, talking, playing, encountering new objects and ideas together every day. They spend their formative first years on this planet, describing their own unique interpretation of the world as it unfolds around them, with all of the extraordinary poetry that lives within their bodies and through 100 different languages. Through the beating of clay, the drawing of ants and the listening of their eyes, they speak and the adults pay careful attention. Withdrawing and recalibrating our attention, simply being present, can be thought of as activism in itself. By doing so, we gain time to think, 
break out of online echo chambers and undermine extractive business models. It means we can direct attention towards deserving beings and causes and towards shaping a new reality together. Utopia. It's a loaded word. And maybe we don't have time to talk about idealism. For just a moment, take a deep breath in and imagine yourself on the road. A tour de force against the world. You are the perfect five-door people carrier. Work ethic, elbow grease and a bit of motor oil. And one day you too may become a Citroen Zara. Onwards. The goal of the future is full unemployment so we can play. Arthur C. Clarke. Why fully automated luxury communism? Why those words, and in that sequence? After all, many see communism as nothing more than a failed experiment of the 20th century, undeserving of our attention, save learning from its mistakes. Some may admit that capitalism has numerous flaws and may indeed end one day, But if communism is what comes next, that wouldn't be an improvement. While it is true that a number of political projects have labelled themselves communist over the last century, the aspiration was neither accurate nor, as we will go on to see, technologically possible. Communism is used here for the benefit of precision, the intention being to denote a society in which work is eliminated, scarcity replaced by abundance, and where labour and leisure blend into one another. Given the possibilities arising from the third disruption, with the emergence of extreme supply in information, labour, energy, and resources, it should be viewed not only as an idea adequate to our time, but impossible before now. Fully automated luxury communism does not underpin the trends of the third disruption. It is their conclusion, if we want it. or the Met, and a gentleman in black tie, and elegant ladies bejeweled, and a velvet curtain rising. Well, Eugenia Zuckerman is about to take us to a different but no less inspiring setting, and to a different but no less appreciative audience. This is Opera on the Farm.
scientists are currently studying what dreams actually are, the relationship between neurophysiology and dream psychoanalysis, the brain waves that are involved in dreaming, and so on. What are your thoughts on dreams? Are you you able to remember your dreams? What do you usually dream about? And you're looking to recharge your batteries. You start to unwind. You settle into bed and it feels great. You close your eyes and drift off into the various stages of sleep. And perhaps you start to dream. I have unlocked. Discovered a secret to living in these bodies that we hold. And oh, yes, it's very, 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 very serious. The secret is laughter. Now, I'd like to discuss processing and communication. Somewhere, a sun. Below, boys brown as rye play the dozens and ball, jump in the air and stay there. Boys become new moons, gum dark on all sides, beg bruise, blue water to fly, at least tide, at least spit back a father or two. I won't get started. History is what it is, it knows, what it did. Bad dog, bad blood, bad day to be a boy, color of a July well spent. But here, not earth, not heaven, boys can't recall their white shirt turned a ruby gown. Here, there is no language for officer or law, no color to call white. If snow fell, it fall black. Please don't call us dead. Call us alive someplace better. We say our own names when we pray. We go out for sweets and come back. I hold the hand of my partner. I feel so safe. Imagine this feeling. Holding, looking into her, their eyes feeling so good. I imagine myself looking into my work from the side and thinking how great it is. I imagine myself appreciating the creative work of others and thinking how great it is. I'm imagining myself being the person I really want to be without the ego-based actions that are stopping me from doing that. I love myself, I love my body, I unconditionally love other people, I show affection so easily, I do artwork so easily, so productively. I get so inspired, I collaborate, I am like not trying to be something I am not and I appreciate myself for who I am. I am so loving, I am so grateful, I am so blessed, I am so creative. Once upon a time there lived a cadet laddie. And this cadet laddie had a wee red caddy. For by this bit caddy he'd collect it for some day. The cadet had seen a red corpuscle in his body. He thought he heard a revel, wished thought, Lucian. Ridden bloody. The wee cadet was ready with his blood red caddy. Like Grumphy's in Claver lived the hale cadet caboodle. The cadet and his caddaddy and his grandpa cadoodle. But up wafted a ruffling ostropolis blood o' wind and rip it thon caddy to a shadder. Caddy less cadet, black heed it and shoddy. The red woofs came and had him with her toddy. Abody kens that woofs was no ill deedy. 
but they gouped him, cuffs and all, like moz at a haddy. So again you play at politics, my and my lady, mind o' the ballad o' the wee red caddy. Fiddle my fidgin. The fiddle near Dwinslet to Nathan, was seeching and beseeking, to we a blast that burst out greeting, say like a wane, that the drum had to say, wheel din, wheel din, wheel din. But it grew weary and all, weary a hearing the lang dridgin fiddly bits, and slunk her out into the red het, Kuznetsky, and donner a wa. The one glinket scans like at who, the fiddle was greeting its hair out, wi nae words, wi nae measure, and a stupid symbol by its lane, stert it to bash in some corner. What's that? What's it dain? But yins the bombard on, the breezy snook it, sweet and chook it tuba, can blowin, eat it, dry up, dung it. I got to my feet, spracklet, stature in among the crotchets, the fricted music stones all crunklet, cried out, the good kens why, my god. I kiss myself on they wooden shooters, do you ken whip my fiddle? The gate your gangin's off you like my road, just like you I, yowp and yowl, and can he prove a thing to others? Lockter fade the bondsman, sticky in for him, a wooden woman for his wedding day, his he'd seen to, but me, I dinna gi a dokin, me, I'm no so bad man, do you ken whip my fiddle? We man, set up hoose together, what do you say? What I think about the future? Ain't there ain't no future, no, that's all it is to it. No future at all. Why don't you think it's the future? Ken they, they killed Kennedy, they killed Kang, they killed Evers. They're killing all the, all the people that do something. Yeah, that do something for the, on the black man, you know, that, that stood up for him. Those are the only men that really stood up for him. And I don't know, it seems like it's, it's conspiracy. I don't know, people say maybe it isn't, you know, but I think it really is. It has, it has to be something, you know. I don't think there is much of a future at this point. You mean from black people? Not much at all. They're just killing everybody that, that, that for, wanna, nation. for the it's nation the itself. When we do feminist work, we are doing the kind of work that changes the world for everybody. It is important to feel free, but it is more important to make sure we get free, socially, politically, economically, artistically. Here we see why the decisions we make early on about what kind of feminist we will be are so important. It is vital to correct the misinformation about what it means to be a feminist in theory and in practice. Imagine this, a world where the quality of your life is not determined by how much money you have. You do not have to sell your labour to survive. Labour is not tied to capitalism, profit or wage. Borders do not exist, we are free to move without consequence. The nuclear family does not exist, children are raised collectively, reproduction takes on new meanings. In this world, the way we carry out dull domestic labour is transformed and nobody is forced to rely on their partner economically to survive. The principles of transformative justice are used to rectify harm. Critical and comprehensive sex education exists for all from an early stage. We are liberated from the gender binary strangling grip and the demands it places on our body. Sex work does not exist because work does not exist. Education and transport are free from cradle to grave. We are forced to reckon with and rectify histories of imperialism, colonial exploitation and warfare collectively. We have freedom to, not just freedom from. Specialist mental health services and community care are integral to our societies. There is no state as we know it. Nobody dies in suspicious circumstances at its hands. No person has to navigate sexism, racism, disabledism or homophobia to survive. Detention centres do not exist, prisons do not exist, nor do the police. The military and their weapons are disbanded across nations. Resources are reorganised to adequately address climate cat catastrophe. No person is without a home or loving community. We love one another without possession or exploitation or extraction. 
we all have enough to eat well due to redistribution of wealth and resource. We all have the means and the environment to make art if we so wish. All cultural gatekeepers are destroyed. Now imagine this vision not as utopian but as something well within our reach. The vision I have presented has its limitations, there are gaps, contradictions and things that have been omitted. But without the capacity to imagine in this way, feminism is purposeless. Let us fight over a vision, because our demands must spring from somewhere. This is the task handed down to us and we must approach it with the urgency it demands. We must rise to the challenge with a revolutionary and collective sense of determination, knowing that if we do not see this world, someone else will.